Hello, everyone. Welcome to another capsule, International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. The topic we have chosen for today is Putin versus Wagner. We have all been following the events relating to the Russia-Ukraine war, and we knew that it is going through a very critical time for President Putin. Uh, he has not won the war that he had expected. There has been assistance. And so the things were going in a direction which was not very favorable to him. But now, surprise of surprises, we hear that he also has challenges within his country. This was expected. Many people thought that when a leader loses a battle, then his own supporters might turn against him. This is a normal, normal thing that happens in the world. So, but this has come up from very unexpected quarters. The rebellion has come from one of his closest associates, Mr. Prigozhin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who was very close to Mr. Putin personally, even though officially he was supposed to be an informal group, the group that is called Wagner, with Mr. Yevgeny Prigozhin as the leader. Uh, has been working in the country and outside for a long time. People knew about its existence. People also knew that he had the support of President Putin. And like many other governments, he used this as what is called the dirty tricks department. That is things which cannot be done by the government, or at least the government cannot uh, accept that it has done, it should be denied. If the government does something which is which has to be denied, which is deniable, are normally given to some kind of agency like this. This is common in many governments. I don't know how many, but most governments have this kind of a dirty tricks department. And uh, Mr. Prigozhin was the leader of this group, Wagner, which has been operating for several years. It started as a small group, and now he claims there are more than 30,000. Some believe it is 50,000 because there is no record of what he does and what they do, where they go, but they seem to be going all over the place, um, basically to protect the interests of Russia. And that may mean killing some people, rewarding some others, taking them into custody or looking after them. All this is part of the game, and that is very well known. It's a little more than spying, not just gathering information, but also acting uh, on that information that they have. And this has been going on, people knew. But uh, of course, uh, a few days ago, if Mr. Putin was asked, he would say there is no such thing. Uh, but all of a sudden, on 24th of, uh, uh, of July, there was an insurrection by this group. People knew that this was coming because as the uh, Russian army failed in several of their enterprises, the uh, Wagner group started uh, criticizing the army and saying that they were not doing the right things. So there was some kind of rivalry developing between the two. And Mr. Putin may have closed his eyes to it because this, is, this will take its own position and they will somehow come to a conclusion, etc. But unexpectedly, it went beyond his control. Suddenly, this group occupied a little town and declared that they have not only taken this town, they were now marching to Moscow. Why they were marching to Moscow was not very clear, but there was some hint that there might be a change of presidency in um, Moscow, which is a very serious thing for Putin. So it appeared that they were marching towards Moscow. And if that march went on, naturally, uh, the, there would be a war, there would be a fight between the Russian army and the Wagner army. Both are friends, relatives, collaborators, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that Putin could not have afforded. So he came out very openly and very strongly against uh, uh, Wagner and said that uh, if it moves to Moscow, it will be, a, it will be eliminated and uh, the leaders should be punished. That was his first reaction. Very strong reaction, which everybody expected. But within a day, that is by 26th morning, there was another uh, development, another declaration by Mr. Putin that uh, this mutiny has ended. And um, this was under the 
uh, good offices of the president of uh, Belarus, who is a great friend of Mr. Putin. He has been supporting him in many ways. And so slowly the terms of the understanding were revealed that um, uh, Mr. Uh, Prigozhin and his group will move to Belarus so that they are protected from the Russian army because the Russian army was very angry and if they stayed in Russia, maybe there will be conflicts. And so the first announcement came that they're all moving to Belarus and they will either settle there or slowly they will come back. No action will be taken against the leaders. So that was the crucial point. And uh, we do not know what actually happened after that. In any case, the mutiny or the revolt ended and the army withdrew, the Wagner army or um, mercenaries, if you want to call them, because they are paid for their job. They don't have any idea or ideology. So this has happened in other countries, nothing very new. But the surprising part was the fierceness of the move by Wagner. And also the equal force with which Putin sought to meet it. But then both of them decided very quickly that in this situation of this war in Ukraine, such a development would be devastating for Russia. And I think that is what finally decided that we should have a compromise. And uh, in fact, the NATO and United States etc., must have been very happy that this happened. And they were probably preparing their moves on the presumption that there might be a change in Kremlin. Because Mr. Yevgeny Precaution is known to be very strong, ruthless, he kills people, does whatever he wants. So it would not have been beyond him to go against Mr. Putin. But both of them realized that this was not going to be in the interest of the country, not certainly in the interest of the world, and therefore a solution was found. But what this solution means and how it will be implemented, in fact, it also says those in the uh, in the Wagner group can either continue to be in the group and remain in Belarus, and then they can act from there. Others who do not want to be a mercenary, they can come and join the Russian army, become regular soldiers, or still others who do not want to do anything can go home. This is a very liberal and generous um, settlement of the crisis. But some people still report that uh, uh, Mr. Prigozhin is still in Russia and that he has not gone to Belarus. We don't know. But anyway, this has been now concluded. The threat to Mr. Putin is not there. And so he can go ahead and prepare to fight the um, NATO and uh, Ukraine. But it is not as simple as that because uh, you know what Mr. Putin was aiming at. He was aiming at going beyond the Soviet Revolution. He was not uh, fancy, was not fancied about the Soviet Revolution or actions of his predecessors. He condemned all of them that they destroyed the Tsar, Tsarist Empire. The Russian Empire was ruined by them, and communism has destroyed Russia. These were his ideas. And for a man who has such ambitious agenda, to be scared to be shivering at this prospect of a few of his own people attacking him and will not do him any good because uh, his image as a heroic uh, leader and, um, and the controller of very many things and also uh, willing to wanting to win the war, this was a, certainly a, a matter of uh, um, his uh, image being uh, dented. So, but he, this was a man who was once, uh, Prokoshin was one of, a man who was once called a hero of the Russian Federation. And, uh, and on the other hand, he was once in, in jail. So all these uh, uh, activities of his, and now as a private military company uh, on delicate mission, and uh, he's being challenged by uh, uh, such a group. He's obviously uh, quite uh, damaging to the reputation of uh, Mr. Putin. So whatever may be the solution, uh, it uh, certainly not 
added to the strength and the capacity of Mr. Putin. So now we know more about Wagner Group, and they were basically uh, recruiting prisoners because prisoners who have been uh, who have been um, uh, punished for uh, very cruel crimes are the ones they particularly selected because they don't have any fear about blood or bloodshed or anything of that kind. So they were basically recruited among the prisoners. They were allowed to go into the prison and recruit the more ruthless ones. And um, so this is a real setback. And uh, because uh, the there was a real rivalry, and perhaps what Mr. Progoshin wanted to be was the Russian defense minister. And this may not have been possible because his record is not very, very good. So in any case, the, what he tried uh, fizzled out. Was not uh, he was not able to grab grab, grab power. And uh, it's obvious that uh, the authorities were prepared for it. It looks as though uh, they knew such a thing would happen. There were confrontations between Wagner and uh, Russian soldiers. So a compromise was negotiated, as I said earlier. And uh, But this is not the end of the story. So it is possible that uh, Wagner may have a new group, new leader, and uh, they may become loyal to Putin again or they may gain strength among the oligarchs. As you know, Russia is run by a number of oligarchs, the powerful barons, the, the rich billionaires. So, so because of all this, uh, it, it is a loss for uh, uh, Putin. Uh, but of course, he is um, uh, fighting, the, fighting the war, and there is no signal that uh, there will be any any end to the war very soon. But there is expectation that this particular experience may have taught Putin a lesson. He could either be um, conciliatory to make sure that his soldiers remain with him and the other oligarchs do not uh, create such problems. Or on the other hand, he may become very ruthless. But he seems to be taking the first line of being reasonable and rational and try to contain the situation and fight the war against uh, NATO. Uh, there, there are very dangerous signals. A drone seems to have flown over uh, Putin's palace and various other things are happening. And uh, President Zelensky is in a, in a very good mood. Uh, NATO is uh, supporting him fully, fully. And there have been reports most recently that the CIA as soldiers in the, in uh, Ukraine. This is something which they had never accepted, but seems to have been a, some development of a CIA being involved in a secret war in Ukraine. At the same time, uh, efforts are being made. Uh, G20 is supposed to meet in September. And uh, in fact, today, today or yesterday, there was an indication that Mr. Putin will actually come to Delhi. This has been a matter of speculation whether uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Putin will come to Delhi. Of course, Pakistan is also a question mark whether they want to come to Delhi. And that is the reason why recently the Shanghai Cooperation Summit could not be held in person. Because originally, uh, all of them were supposed to come to Delhi. But this would not have been the moment for all of them to come to Delhi and fight against each other. And so I think our Prime Minister very wisely turned it into an online meeting. So that means they don't have to move anywhere. They can sit in the comfort of their own palaces and make statements, etc. And that is what they did. And um, Shanghai Cooperation, as you know, has several elements which are not uh, suitable for India. That's another problem. I've always wondered why we are in the Shanghai Cooperation. Because it was not meant for countries like India. Uh, it was meant for the previous Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republics. And it was basically under the control of the Russians and later the Chinese because it was formed in Shanghai. So Chinese dominated and Russia support China in that effort. And these uh, small um, Central Asian republics are all part of it. They have no choice. And so in that, what was the point of India in entering it? I don't know. But we decided because uh, we have an interest in Central Asia. 
and we thought if this group we are a member we might be able to influence them but so far we have not managed to do that that uh, they speak with one voice with russia and china and our voice is not heard very much but we still were persisting with it and by rotation we got the chairmanship so we very obligingly organized this conference online mercifully otherwise there would have been more difficulties and uh, one of the problems we faced was that there was an endorsement of the belt and road initiative which india could not have accepted because belt and road initiative one of these projects runs through occupied kashmir so that is not something which is acceptable and that is why we are kept out of belt and road initiative but then all other countries in the co are supportive of it and there was a so a proposal was made to make a statement in support of the belt and road initiative so we made it very clear that we will not be able to so that conference was not a, such a great success uh, but within them excluding india pakistan etc they may have had some discussions on some, some decisions and uh, now iran is being admitted to that and so it's taking another uh, color uh, which not which may not be very fruitful for us so and so far the g20 discussions on what's happening in ukraine have not been successful the foreign ministers meeting decided not to have a joint communique because unlike in bali summit where there was a communique acceptable to both russia china and united states and supposedly negotiated by us and president clinton uh, president biden specifically said that india played a role and there was some recognition of india's role because india since it was able to speak to both the sides with conviction and also they wanted peace so people thought that this would be a good idea that india had this position rather than a position of condemnation of russia and that is what of course led to the visit of the of our prime minister to washington because the difficulties relating to the ukraine india's position on ukraine was forgiven and forgotten as it were in order to improve relations between india and the united states with an eye on china so this is what really happened we talked about talked about it in the last uh, episode so, uh, th- so these are all various uh, developments taking place and therefore people are looking at the situation in delhi in september so in september if uh, uh, putin himself is there and the chinese president is there and pakistan prime minister is there then there would be some kind of a possibility of some some compromise but people don't expect that because both sides uh, russia and the united states have only uh, further enhance their uh battle capabilities uh, in ukraine because the secretary of state was in uh, beijing and now the secretary of commerce or finance she is going there she is already there and so efforts are being made of course some to create some kind of peace between china and the us because china is a very important factor in this war because they are openly on the side of the russians so many things are happening which we do not know but everything is now focusing towards the september uh, summit um of g20 g20 as i have been saying has certain uh, capability uh, to deal with this because none of the members has a veto and um, all the most important countries of the world are there and therefore if there is an agreement there they could have a better impact on the world situation but that is not yet to be to be seen on the ground but why i am saying this is already been covered but what i am saying is that in this delicate moment the crisis that putin has faced may have an adverse impact on the situation because we do not know the extent of what uh, the wagner group has has done and they are also talking about recruiting new mercenaries from other countries and one of the groups now showing interest in going to uh, russia after the oil this group are the gurkhas gurkhas in the in nepal you know they go and work for fight for any country but they are a kind of respectable soldiers because they have a certain amount of code of conduct they are very heroic 
etc. So they are not considered mercenaries. They are considered respectable soldiers hired by other countries. They are not fighting for their country, but certainly they are not doing anything uh, of a criminal character. And that is a good thing about the Gurkhas. So it's quite possible that uh, some Gurkhas may join and that may be a balancing factor in this whole exercise. But we should realize that all around the world these things exist. Mercenaries exist. Governments have a secret operation uh, to do things and then deny it. So they all have not only spy organizations, but also spy organization with a little uh, punch in it that they are able to also act, not merely collect information. So they collect information, analyze it, and even take action necess as necessary on the ground, as the uh, Wagner group did with the Russian soldiers, and gave the impression that they were trying to capture the uh, Russian army. So this adds, this particular event adds to the complexity of the Ukraine war. Because we know now that Putin is not the only actor. Because we've all been thinking that's all in the one man's head. And uh, we have to study his mentality, his uh, trends, his past. That's exactly what we are all doing. But we know that now there are other actors, some of them as powerful as the Wagner group which has recorded in several countries, several African countries, they have been there. Uh, Libya, they have been there. Mali, they have been there. And um, so what were they doing there? Syria, Lebanon, Libya, all these countries, this group has been working. And now Mr. Putin has publicly stated that all their expenses were being met by the state, not him personally. And that is a revelation which uh, nobody knew and the Russian people were not uh, privy to that information which has come out. So we have to wait and see how the Wagner group behaves in the future, whether it will lead to a bigger uh, plot against uh, President Putin. And that is what he has avoided by making peace with them. Suppose they had gone to fight against them, it was possible that others may also join them. So he did not want to test that. So after saying that we will finish you off and we'll punish you, etc., within 24 hours he agreed to a ceasefire, agreed to a compromise, and that compromise is one-sided because Wagner has all the advantages. They can do what they want. They will not go to jail, and um, they will probably be reinstated as they were before, and all this may happen. So we have to watch this and see how the war goes after this. So far, things do not look bright, but uh, it looks like Putin is getting ready to come to New Delhi. And that's a good sign. But then there are several months before that, and anything, I met, anything can happen as it happened on the 24th of July and ended on 26th of July. So it's a fascinating, mysterious activity, but this will have to take into account in analyzing the situation in the Ukraine. Well, SEO does not have a specific position on the war because it is a, basically a regional grouping. So since Russia and China are there, we can imagine what their position will be. But then India and Pakistan are also there, and therefore they cannot, if they take a direct position on the war, then the, they will not have the acceptance of uh, at least India. And even some of the Central Asian republics may not join. So they don't have a position on this. And they did not have a joint agreement. There were differences in that. How can India deal with BRI and Pearl of Strings? Well, these are old questions. They have been in existence. The string of Pearl was there and it is there. But we are dealing with the, with the Pearls so that they don't harm us as a string. So we are improving our bilateral relations with uh, all these countries. And there have been some improvements. So they're not as solidly behind China as they used to be. And BRI, there is nothing we can do, but uh, Russians themselves, I'm sorry, Chinese themselves are seeing that this is not a workable proposition because they are investing in these countries and all those investments are being shown as a debt and all these countries are getting into a debt trap and they get uh, infrastructure which they may not need or it's beyond their needs. And therefore, people are disillusioned already. 
So it's because quite possible that some of them may withdraw, some are already done, and the enthusiasm is not there. And therefore, we do not need to do anything. It lies so natural that. That's not, we don't, our relations with USA does not depend on one or two faces in, uh, inside Moscow. That's all understood. That's it. Their own system is such. It is not a, a fully legitimate system. So they have all kinds of aspects in it. But we go, we are dealt with Russia, Soviet Union and Russia, as it is beneficial to us in whatever way. And therefore, that does not be a factor in our relations with the United States. So what, what has happened is the United States is now offering us technology which they normally do not give to non-allies. And they have accepted our non-alignment -align and they say, but still we need you. So take these weapons and equip equipment yourself uh, to meet the Chinese threat. And that is something and uh, very courageous of them to offer and it was even more courageous of us to accept that this is not uh, the last word. There will be other opinions within India, in the international community. Many things have to be still sorted out, and that will take its own course. Well, all this diaspora has really no role in this. Diaspora is part of our soft power, and uh, they basically support us by getting their governments to take a friendly position towards India, at least in the uh, United States and Russia and uh, UK. That is the role that the diaspora is playing. They'll continue to play that. And uh, the rivalry between US and China has helped us in this, that they are becoming closer to us because of their increasing fear of China, but the diaspora has nothing to do. But is it strategic neutrality? We say, no, it is not neutrality in that sense because we are against aggression. We want the war to end, but um, our position is one of peacemaking. And um, that will carry on till the war ends because we have no inter interest in involving it. We, the whole world is in crisis because of that. And therefore, it is important for the war to end, and that is what India is working on. That is being tried. China is trying, India is trying, there may be others. There is a move for what is called de-dollarization. And that is an effort being made to move away from the unipolar world. Because unipolar world depends also on the um, you know, power of the United States. And if the power of the United States is less, there is a better opportunity for a multipolar world to develop. So, uh, universalization of Indian rupee, etc. is far away because the United States is not going to crumble like that. Chinese are also making an effort. Iranians are trying. And we heard some reports that uh, some rupee payments have been made to Russia for oil. But that is also not new because we have had a, a rupee-ruble agreement with Russia even before. So, these are all but small movements, moves, which have to be watched, it may grow into something bigger. But at the moment, I wouldn't say the universalization of the rupee is a possibility. You may know that several Gulf countries had rupee as a legal tender for several years, Indian rupee. It was called the Gulf Indian rupee. And it ended because there was difficulty in the international market. They probably joined with one purpose. And uh, once you join a group, it is uh, very difficult to get out of it. And then uh, that will create unnecessary confusion. So possibly we should have uh, taken this into, into consideration when we joined. So unless there is any big provocation, we are not going to withdraw from it. We, can be, we may be absent. We may not join the decision making. Because it is a Chinese organization. I must say not. Because we are a democracy. We want people to know. It has to be transparent. Who we are friendly with. What kind of army we have. 
what are kind of organizations we have. We also have an external agency which collects the information. Where they take any action, I don't know. But India is a sovereign country, as you know. So whatever may have been issued by the international court is not really applicable unless we agree to that. That is the difference about the International Court of Justice. It is not automatically applicable to sovereign states. So in fact, you can take a case to the International Court of Justice only if all the parties agree. So um, a strictly legal position may not be applicable to us. Well, recently there has been a talk about reforming the UN. Recently, I have myself dealt with it for 37 years. <laughs> It is very old. It started off right from the beginning, after the, after the UN was established. Even when it was being established, there were proposals to reform. And it was reformed from 9 to 15. Security Council number was expanded also. So it is not, it's a continuing process of reforming of the UN. But new permanent members, there is a problem because not only permanent members, but also non-permanent members agree that there should be new permanent members. So this is not an issue of permanent members at all. Even non-permanent members, small countries do not support it because they have no advantage in India or Brazil or Japan or Germany becoming permanent members. What will they get? The permanent members will act in their own interests. So another country to be included in the permanent member line, as you say it, is not likely. So what do you think is the next best thing that uh, can be done? Nothing. We keep pressurizing. We keep emphasizing the disc discriminatory aspect of it. Prime Minister speaks very strongly. Some countries have uh, privately supported, publicly opposed, publicly supported, privately opposed. All these games are going on. By my judgment to you, judgment on this is that this is not likely in the near future. There may be some improvements, some more permanent mem non-permanent members may be included. It may be more longer terms for non-permanent members and thing, things like that. So uh, this has no impact on that. Because we have a one China policy like everybody else. Even US has a one China policy. But they are not willing to accept Taiwan as part of China. That's the difference. So they would want both China and Taiwan to coexist. And we also have good relations with Taiwan. We have an office, a diplomatic office in Taiwan. Of course, we don't call him an ambassador. My own brother was there. But we call him special representative or trade representative or something. But we have very good collaboration with Taiwan in many ways. It's a, uh, a powerful country and um, a population, 20, 23, 24 million people and very much close to us, our country, and close to China. So it's a, some importance for us, and then we recognize that much. But formally, we cannot recognize, because we can only recognize one China. We keep our relations at the present level or better with Russia. So we have benefits. But at the same time, there are very many limitations in Russia's capability, particularly now. Because since the war has started, their supplies to India, including S-400, have dwindled, dwindled. We still don't know when all this will be available. But for us to alter it and change into some other country, that is not easy to do, because the percentages are very high. So please explain the bifurcation between signatory and ratification in agreement and their conditions, please. What is bifurc bifurcation between them? The country has the right to ratify. If they don't ratify, that is not binding on you. Of course, at the time of the CTBT, that's the Comprehensive Trust Bank Treaty, a lot of pressure applied on India, saying that uh, if you do not sign, uh, there will be sanctions against you. But that is absolutely nonsensical. The, all all uh, agreements are uh, by agreement, and you cannot take action against somebody for not signing an agreement. And we have got away with it. Nobody has done anything to us. We have not signed it yet. So uh, such uh, blackmail is not, not acceptable. 
Will the said negotiations include something other than membership of our Ukraine? What could be other potential terms of negotiation? I don't really know. But it started, as you all know, because of Russian fear that Ukraine will join NATO. Because there was an understanding that Ukraine and many other countries will join NATO later, like the Baltic Republics, and even most recently Finland and so on. The understanding that they will not be allowed to join NATO. And that situation has changed. But NATO has been careful not to admit NATO, to admit uh, Ukraine into NATO, because that means they will have to openly fight against Russia. So that is the reason why I suppose they are going slow on that. And uh, so they would prefer not to have an open confrontation with Russia as NATO, but through Ukraine and try and to weaken Russia so that uh, Ukraine can also be a, an independent country. Are we not implying to the world that we are sliding towards authoritarianism by not condemning Putin and this war? Not at all. Because that's a different matter. Whether we are authoritarian or not, it is our choice. But uh, we are not giving any implication, any suggestion that we are also going to be authoritarian. The Prime Minister was very open in this in Washington. Normally he doesn't talk about it when such situation. Such questions are, are raised. But he said it very, very, very clearly where India stands, where our constitutional provisions are, and how it is necessary for to fight terrorism and uh, other antisocial elements. So if terrorism ends and uh, internal confusion ends, then India will be as beneficent and uh, as benevolent a uh, democracy as it has always been. So, but that also U.S. has acknowledged it, because before Prime Minister Modi went to U.S., 75 parliamentarians demanded that uh, he should be asked questions about human rights situation in India. Some of them did not attend, but all the 75 did not keep out of the joint session that Prime Minister Modi addressed. So, it is a general, general uh, sentiment in, in the United States for the poor people, for minorities. That was part of their tradition. So the government is uh, legally required to raise these issues with other governments. And uh, even against the communist governments and others. About China, they raise a huge noise. But in our case, it is some uh, people who are either good intentioned or with bad intentions, they criticize India and try to project India as an authoritarian country. But that is now over by our joining with U.S. against China in practical terms. We have shown that we will be with democracies, we will not be with autocracies. The new world order may consist of autocracies on one side and democracies are on the other. And we have to naturally be on the side of democracies and that is what we are doing at the moment. Not in a military sense, certainly not. So human, our human resources are available to the whole world, and we go there. You know, many many Indians are lining up for visas in many countries. We don't consider it as a negative. Whatever, they'll go there. Maybe they get better opportunities, or they will create better opportunities, as it has happened in the Gulf. So it all brings only credit to India. So I'm not against Indians migrating to other countries. But of course, if they are going to join foreign armies and things like that, IS and so on, then that is a dangerous trend and we should prevent that. So just because we have people, it doesn't mean that they must go and fight unholy wars and uh, create problems of our friendly countries. So that we will not accept and we will not join, whether we have human resources or not. Well, India join NATO or, or plus that has been completely denied. <laughs> by the foreign minister, that he, that the prime minister also said this is not in our DNA, joining military alliances. And uh, that question does not arise. But Americans have a kind of category of um, non-NATO alliances. And that is what they are aiming at. But certainly not NATO. But by accepting all these technological transfers, etc., we are virtually doing that. In fact, we are moving towards... Uh, US-centered uh, defense uh, program. But the ultimate utilization will be ours. We are going to pay money for these things. It's not free. 
And uh, therefore, it is only fair enough that we make use of that facility. Recently, the US senators have been kind of pushing India to join NATO. Yes, we already discussed that, citing easy transfer technology and defense equipment. This choice we had in 1947, don't forget that, <laughs> before any of this happened. Prime Minister Nehru said we are not joining either of the groups. Otherwise, it, both the groups were willing to welcome us. So we will have an obligation to meddle in the affairs that we don't want to in the first place. We will not. So what is your opinion on the pushing and pulling down done by the senators? Yes, they are considering America's interests and we will take care of Indian interests. Just because they are saying that we are not going to jump into it. That's an option we had in 1947. We have rejected it then, we reject it now. We would rather stick to our good old strategy, autonomy. And our foreign minister has recently said that non-alignment is non-negotiable. So that is our position. They are already facing a lot of challenge because Ukraine had uh, many interests in us. We have many interests in Ukraine. It is a uh, land of grain, land of uh, oil. All these are required for us. And uh, the stoppage of uh, rail import, export, even NATO is trying to get it relaxed. So we will have to work within the present conditions. But is, if Ukraine is totally free, and Russians uh, leave control, then they will come back to us. Or we may have our 20,000 medical students going back to Ukraine. Happy days may come back. Uh, but as of now, we have to operate within this situation. But we are not respecting the Russian sanctions against uh, Ukraine. And because that's not in our interest. So we are not bursting sanctions because these sanctions are imposed by one country. It is not a UN sanctions. So we are not obliged to do that. It's an optional thing. And so we have decided not to engage in that. Yes, so they are not uh, fighting for Kashmir or sending troops there. Or anything like that. There, but there is a OIC, that is Organization for Islamic Cooperation, has a position. And uh, these people are pressurized by Pakistan every time there is an OIC meeting. And uh, they all pass a resolution. And then they come to us. Most of them tell us, in the UN when I was there, soon after an OIC meeting, they will seek a meeting with us and say that, you know, our position is that this should be peacefully resolved. But you will understand that uh, within the OIC, we cannot really speak out against uh, Pakistan. And there is a brother, brotherhood working world in here. But you know our policy, so please don't worry. That's what they normally tell us. And we accept their word. And they have not sent jihadis to Kashmir or anything like that, God forbid. And uh, so uh, Egypt may say, uh, people of Egypt have a right to self-determination, people of Russia or Kashmir. Or they may say that uh, Pakistan uh, should be a, a referendum or plebiscite. And such things are technical. Right? They have no value in the present day world. It is part of India forever and forever. And uh, so these things are purely diplomaties for people like me when I was a diplomat. You know, we made a living out of all these arguments and counter arguments and positions and counter positions. And all. So that is how diplomats live. So let us leave it to them, but uh, be sure that uh, nothing is going to happen in these cases. It will have to be a long struggle to convince Pakistan and that will be in their own interest to resolve this issue. And that's all that I can say. And that day will come sooner or later. Thank you very much. It was a very rich discussion. We discussed almost everything. <laughs> though, though we are using Wagner as an excuse. So thank you very much for all those questions. Thank you very much.